Hi, this is Mark Arnold with yet another Fun Ideas podcast, and today we have a returning guest who has written a brand new book, and if you haven't guessed by my background, it's on the long-running game show Wheel of Fortune, and uh, this is Wesley Hyatt, who has been on the show before. Come on. About Carol Burnett and Bob Hope and other things, but today we're talking about Wheel of Fortune. So welcome to the show, Wesley. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Hope you are too. Yes, I'm doing very well. I just came back from a big trip from England, so I, you know now I'm like, okay, I got to do podcasts again. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're letting me be part of that. Thank you. Welcome back. Well, thank you. Um, so I guess the inevitable question is, why Wheel of Fortune? And then we'll kind of get into the history and all that stuff. So, well, Wheel uh, come uh, January 2025 is going to be 50 years old on the air which is a rarity among any kind of show in broadcasting yep. and um i thought it would be have some good stories to tell and as it turned out they did at the same time uh i there's been no real book devoted to the show uh there have been a couple kind of but nothing like a, a full history of it so i knew that would make it stand out that way <clears throat> that way mm -hmm. and i also knew it would give me um some side benefits of talking about like some of the history of daytime television programming as well when it comes to game shows and uh, some of the intricacies of the syndicated world that it's now living in uh so there was a lot there to choose from and um i think i've come up with a pretty good representation of all the elements i wanted to get across when i came up with a book okay. now did you come up with the idea prior to pat sajak announcing his retirement or was that just a happy coincidence <laughs> that was a happy coincidence i sold it to bear manor media um basically ben omart there i guess i should say you know the head there of it um basically a couple of weeks before he we learned that pat was going to be retiring back in uh 2023 so i was like oh I know what the ending of the book is going to be so um that was that was looking out uh that way i was mainly looking at it for this uh, effect of getting the book out in time for the 50th anniversary and giving uh um, you know trying to beat anyone else who had the idea at the same time to you know being timely so right okay yeah and uh i have unfortunately not seen the book but i figured i i knowing your other books i know kind of what stuff is probably in there but uh let us know kind of who you interviewed and who you got in contact with for this book um well i basically had about over 60 interviews uh the big get was uh susan stafford the original letter turner co-host of the show i got several people who worked on the show back to its pilot days in the 1970s um and who are still with us thankfully and worked with uh, merv griffin at the time i got several of the winners on the show including the first uh, millionaire winner on the show mm -hmm. and a lot of uh distinctive there i was really lucked into the fact um that i got uh into the group of the wheel of fortune alumni on facebook and they were very generous, very supportive of the project. And I got some recommendations about who to ask to interview. So I got about 20 to 30 interviews that way. Also, I made an effort to try and talk to as many uh, daytime vice president um, of programming that were there at CBS and NBC when it was on the networks there. And I got almost all of the surviving ones except the uh, last one, John Miller, who was uh, for NBC in 1991. He's retired and I couldn't uh, locate him there. But, you know, that was not as consequential as getting some of the input from the others. They really gave a good perspective as to where they thought things were and um, how the show stood up and then included the the story there, the compelling part. I don't think a lot of people know that Fred Silverman was trying to cancel the show in 1980 hmm. when he uh, put David Letterman show on the air in the mornings, he was going to cancel uh, wheel of fortune about a month later, but the initial ratings for the 90 minute morning show were just so horrible um, that they had people at Merv Griffin. They had a guy who not only convinced him to keep it on the air, but he also got more money for the show. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was that was very interesting. But there was a lot of uh, yeah, there were a lot of dynamics going on there because um, Wheel of Fortune was not really it was good for NBC daytime, which <laughs> means that it was a solid second in its uh, 
uh, time slot for most of the time. It was down there. The problem is that NBC was a solid third, you know, in daytime <laughs> among three networks uh, not long after the show debuted. So that's what kept it alive more than anything else. Uh, it, it got much more success when it went into syndication in 1982. Yeah. And I guess was the reason it went into syndication is because of that threat of possibly being canceled on the network or it had nothing to do with it? They were thinking about uh, putting into syndication in 1980, but then came news about NBC canceling it. And then the syndicators, which was, I think, uh, 20th Century Fox decided against it ultimately. Mm -hmm. But then um, a couple of years later, uh, there was a group of gentlemen who uh, their family had gotten success in syndication by putting out the little rascals that just <laughs> things and everything but they had problems ever since then they lost the distribution rights to the joker's wild and tic-tac-doe mm. and they also had a bomb of a uh, daily show called uh, soap world i think or soap life something i, I can't remember I mean, it's in the book i've got it probably yeah, yeah, yeah. um uh, that that nearly went made them go under they took a um gamble on putting the show in night time in 1983 and uh to everyone's surprise it took off rather quickly it was second in the ratings uh, in the november first period of ratings and then by the end of the year it was number one in mm. uh, syndication mm. and um yeah and it's thought a lot of it was due to um vanna white's fashion as much as the game <laughs> itself you know she she never wore anything and, and always looked glamorous so right right yeah um now, it's obvious it's been forever since uh, they paired it with Jeopardy. But I mean, there was a few years there it was in syndication prior to that. What did they pair it with? Was it like Entertainment Tonight or just whatever local feed it, was it going was, on? It or? was paired with whatever they could get. Initially, okay. they were not getting sales in the major markets. It was mm -hmm. uh, they they didn't they didn't really sell New York and Los Angeles until the ratings started coming in. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them thought like, oh, this show's been on the air seven years. It's not much in daytime. Why have it there? <laughs> but its success in the other early initial markets that it had there spread it out at the mm -hmm. time and made it into what it was. Uh, then a year later, um, they paired it up with Jeopardy. Okay. And a Jeopardy, ironically, was the reason why Wheel of Fortune got on the air because – uh, in 1972, when Lynn Boland took over programming at NBC Daytime, she hated Jeopardy. She thought it was, <laughs> yeah, she thought it was boring, old-fashioned, stationary. She hated the small amount of prizes. That was back in the time when the prizes were a tenth of what they're giving away today. So, like right. the first first round would be ten, twenty, thirty, forty, and fifty dollars dollars you know right. so you you'd it'd be incredible if someone actually won over a thousand dollars during a game you know right. when it's finished uh, so because of those reasons she was ready to cancel the show but unfortunately at two things it was still a very strong performer for nbc overall so she couldn't just get rid of it that way and also if she did get rid of it the, merv griffin's contract with the the network because he created uh wheel of fortune was executive uh, jeopardy and was the executive producer uh he would have uh first rights to get a replacement for the show or else they would have to pay him a year worth of salary uh, w with no show on the air. So they gave him the right to try a, a different thing. And he came up with the idea of the two elements, Hangman, which he played as a child, and the um, spinning wheel, which was a roulette type wheel that uh, he was used to seeing at county fairs where people would spin around, you know, and the prize would be won when you, whatever spoke it stopped on. So <laughs> Lynn Bolin was the one who said, who wanted to have the, uh, what they had there, the shopping element at the end. And Merv... Mm reluctantly conceded that in there eventually you know they got rid of that because right. people by the 1980s got really tired of it it took up a lot of time and yes. and as as mg kelly who was a substitute announcer told on the show in the late 80s told me it would there would be times when people would win all 10 to 15 prizes so that meant you know like three minutes worth of ad copy you'd have to read off to the prizes and just be <laughs> exhausted there yeah Plus that Dalmatian dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah, doing an unscripted show. And it was, showed up at one point when he told the contestant to spin the puzzle 
and rather than spin the wheel and they kind of went uh so and it was later revealed by his biographer and several people on the show he had a drinking problem there too Ooh, okay. and it was coming up evident so the show sold and it sold with susan uh stafford who came on there because originally the board was supposed to be electronically showing the letters they couldn't get it to work so they needed a person and this guy said i, I can give you susan stafford and she liked it she was there very energetic so she became part of the show and they went back to chuck woolery and uh even though lynn bolin had some doubts about him they they decided to clear him uh, but it was really close because when nbc announced uh the show coming on the air and a uh November 1974 pre, uh, press release, they didn't have a host connected with it yet, hmm. which is very, very odd for a show that was going to debut in like, uh, you know, less than two months. <laughs> uh, so apparently they cleared it up between then and because they had to, they were taping it, I think, in December, the first couple of episodes, December 74. So it to go on January 6, 1975. So, uh, yeah. And it, uh, by Chuck's own admission, he was not the smoothest of hosts sometimes <laughs> uh, I saw him, you know, uh, on one episode in 76, he uh, talked about a uh, Cuisinart, but instead of giving it that way, he called it a quasar, you know, and uh, he could, <laughs> he would tell people like, um, yes, that's the answer. Oh wait, no, 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 that's not the answer. We got to go again. <laughs> you know, and uh, <laughs> he was not the smoothest of hosts, but that's kind of what's endeared him to some people. Yeah. Um, and then the reason why he left the show in 81, he was basically fired by Merv Griffin because Ooh. he was asking for too much money. Okay. In uh, Merv's eyes, in Merv's eyes. <laughs> uh, there, was a, there was a whole bunch of stuff I talk in there about how NBC was willing to pay the difference, but Merv was like, no, this is my show, and I don't like him going over my head to try and get more money. And <laughs> then, then he added Pat Sajak. And then Susan Stafford left a a year later because she wanted to do more counseling work, which stunned everyone. And why you want to leave a successful TV show to do counseling work, but that's what she did. And as she told me, do I miss the money? Yes. Do I regret the decision? No. And so she's happy with it, even though by that time they were in discussions about doing the syndicated version and they were telling her like, just stay with this. You know, we're going to go into nighttime. You can make even more money. And she's just like, Nope. Mm. So, yeah. So the syndicated version never had uh, Pat and Susan, or did it have Susan for a while or something? There, so, the daytime had Pat and Susan okay. for um, for about a year or two. Or so, uh, but then uh, the nighttime uh, by that time, uh, Vanna White had taken over for Susan, okay. and Vanna got it on there for a very Merv Griffin, I'll call it reason, is that. Um, she had had very little credit. I mean, we can't count on one hand how many credits she'd had professionally in Hollywood. She was struggling and trying to get it. But Merv was saw her head shot and he was impressed. She had a big head in proportion to the rest of her body, which was petite. <laughs> and he thought, this is it, you know? And so he picked her and insisted on it. And uh, Pat kind of helped her over the rough spots, you know, because she was really having, at the end of the show, when they have to kind of, you know, say a few words before saying goodbye it was kind of <laughs> she was tense and everything yeah I remember she, that. Came, her, she came around and yeah, uh yeah. and you know and became the show's biggest booster to the point uh I don't think people realize it but she's actually written some puzzles for the show <laughs> so yeah she's very committed very much a heart and soul and um I think they were smart to keep her on there now with Ryan Seacrest coming in because I think they realized if both Pat and Vanna left some people would probably leave with the show and just go, okay, those are the two reasons I like to watch the show and uh, not give Seacrest a shot with whoever else they had paired. So. Yeah. Um, it's actually airing here on the West coast yep. in about a couple hours. I'll say, <laughs> <laughs> have you, have you seen the new show? So that's what I, you're making it. <laughs> I haven't, but that seems very encouraging from the people who've seen it there. They've all, everybody's been forced to, um, sign NDAs before it goes on the air, but I've heard scuttlebutt from various ones like, yes, he's done a fine job. And okay. said, uh, they've done some revamping with the set, but nothing too drastic an overhaul, which is yeah. key to Wheel of Fortune success. They've, they've made tweaks over the years, but nothing like you go to and like, what is this? You yeah. Know? What I was worried about, I can tell you, is as I've told my wife a few times, because we <laughs> like the show, of course, 
is um, first I didn't know Vanna was going to continue. So I said, oh, that's going to be a bummer. They'll probably just make it an electronic board, like the yeah. British <laughs> version of Wheel of Fortune with Graham yep. Norton, where he just does it himself. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. Well, we'll talk about that if you talk about the foreign <laughs> versions. But uh, but before that, um, I was worried they were going to change Wheel of Fortune to like a, you know, uh, who wants to be a millionaire where it's like all this flashing lights and it's dark. Mm -hmm. And I, you yeah. know, and it's like, if you're going to change it, do it gradually. Like the yeah. thing that I, I've noticed about Wheel of Fortune all these years is, and you could discuss this too, is they've changed the music over the years for the theme and for you know and it's like it was so subtle i didn't realize that they had changed it so many times yeah i thought yeah. they changed it once and then i found out wow they've done it like three or four times yeah so, anyway I, you can go I, on about that <laughs> i credit that, that mostly to um harry friedman who was the executive producer for the show from i think 96 to 2020 um he did a great job of adding in like the the initial toss-up rounds and everything that they had some of the changes of the spaces there to make them include the million dollar wedge mm -hmm. um just uh, very concepts that he thought would work well and as he put it would get more gameplay on the air more than anything else um the de they've designed it so that you know they get you play like eight to ten puzzles a game mm -hmm. back in the old days you know you could there'd be sometimes it would get so bogged down. It would maybe be three, three, three puzzles mm -hmm. uh, that game, you know, because they had to do it, go shopping and everything too. And yeah. that took up a couple of minutes. Um, so he's done a good job of getting that together. They've also, um, they do have it set up so that um, it, they don't need a Vanna really. I mean, cause she just now waves her hands over where the areas are, the, the letters are, mm -hmm. but there's that whole, expectation that you need someone there and keeping that was a good idea when he came along he said there were some people in the mid 90s who were like let's get rid of vanna let's get with someone younger you know because vanna was getting near her near her 40s during the time and there's always that stuff. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and i'll contrast that with ryan seacrest is going to turn 50 um right. in december you right. know but there's no he's considered the young host you know so right. <laughs> go figure well, yeah. I remember there's also talk, and you can tell me when that was, is yeah. when they switched it where she literally had to manually turn the letter to where it's yeah. electronic. When when was that? I mean, that was, that was during that was during the Harry Friedman era around ninety seven. Okay. okay. Uh, what happened? He came on the show as an advisor. Harry Friedman had gone way back. He'd been in game shows for about twenty five years by that point. He began initially as a writer on the original Hollywood squares in the early seventies, where he won four Emmys for his work and coming up with clever um, questions and so on. And then he went into production work and game shows. And uh, then one of the people at Sony uh, asked him, you know, could you, would you mind looking at coming to wheel of fortune taping and see what you think and what we can do. And during that time, it was the manual turning of the letters. And what happened was because of that, they'd have to, after they did a puzzle, they'd have to stop tape for about five minutes and, and unload that and put a new puzzle in, hmm. you know, and get it together and then, then put it and then unveil it and everything. And so the actual taping of a half hour episode was taking 45 to 50 minutes. Hmm. And when Harry said that, he said, you've got to make it electronic. He said, there's, there's no way if one way it's killing the, uh, uh, the, the suspense for the, uh, it's just draining the, the, everyone involved. So they liked his idea. Uh, they had him on as producer and then they basically forced out Nancy Jones who had been producing the show since 1976 um partly because they wanted him in there and partly because she had been kind of obstinate about some of the other changes Sony had been putting in there. And so he came into charge and, and, and he got the, uh, he got the electronic letters in there without within a year or two, and then got the other uh, improvements going along as is to um, make it where it's at, including uh, something may, people might not, not know, but the fact that they have only, they don't have returning champions on the show helps them decide what shows they can actually tape shows and then put them in different orders in which they were taped for a week. If they mm -hmm. think like, okay, um, 
let's build up some excitement. Let's have the winner here on, on Wednesday. And so that'll encourage people to watch Thursday to see if someone else is going to be something like that. Uh, it's very, uh, it's something they weren't able to do on the original show, you yeah. know, because of what they had there. So the, the requirements of, of taping at the time. Yeah. I, although I do know in recent times, they brought back former losers as it were, <laughs> you know, people yeah. that didn't, do very well i mean they they now have started some of the fan favorites thing you know yeah. and um that's been good but it's also some of the some of the older fan uh, the older players wish they they don't think they're really being favored they think they're just bringing the ones who are back who've been on you know the last 10 or 15 years um not anyone from the daytime shows when they really you know were not given that much uh, money or opportunity. Uh, some of them would really like to have that opportunity, but, um, you know, I, I don't think they're going to switch that up, but it is, it is kind of interesting to watch those things though. Anyway, just to see them going, cause it's a good, <laughs> they're, they're, I can tell you it's a good alumni they've got going on the wheel of fortune. These all types of, they're all vibrant personalities and great storytellers. I found. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were one of the original or at least maybe from the eighties or something, yeah. contestants i mean is there any law or anything legally preventing them from applying again to be a contestant again or how does that work um they can't be a contestant again on wheel of fortune they can uh -huh. on other game shows there are okay. like various rules it's always changing i can't pin it down but several of them <laughs> have been on other game shows some of okay. them on price is right um, there's really not that much overlap with, between uh, Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy, which may not surprise some people because <laughs> some people think, you know, Jeopardy is so, such more, more mentally challenging, although, you know, a lot of the Wheel of Fortune people would say otherwise. Um, but yeah, they've, they've done a lot of uh, other game shows they've, they've tried to get on. I think what, I know one or two have tried to get on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Um, yeah, they definitely have an interest in, in going on the show there. Back back in the back in the days uh, on the at least a daytime show in the seventies and eighties, they did have originally it was you could show be up to five days. Then they found that viewers didn't like that as much, so they limited it down to three days. But I did get to talk to one guy who, by a quirk of circumstances, was able to do three days before it um, went to the one day limit in the nineties, and then came back five days because they were having some kind of contest, a special contest, and he won each day, you know, so he oh, holds okay. record for, for eight appearances on the show, which mm -hmm. I think is still stands. So, okay. Yeah. And, and, and back then in those days, uh, you know, since they had the shopping and everything, there was no final round, right? It was just you won game one, the, game two, the, game three. The final, it? The final round emerged, ironically, when Pat Sajak took over back in 1981 on the daytime. Mm -hmm. They find they had tried a couple of bonus rounds and they never worked. They would they they <laughs> would uh, they tried one with like um, different degrees of level, like easy, moderate, hard, and you know, because and everybody tried the hard one and it would they wouldn't get it. You know, that was late 70s. Um, they had. Uh, won like a 60 second speed round during the first year where, where I didn't see it, but I heard Chuck Willard said, solve it, you know, and everything. It just, it just seemed like it was rushed. And I, I can only imagine what it looked like on the air. Yeah. I don't remember yeah, so, that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've watched it pretty much all 50 years, but yeah, I don't remember all the little subtle yeah. things, yeah. you know, like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they, yeah. They, well, cause they came and went so quickly, yeah. you know, they just weren't really working at that. Well, uh, this one finally caught on the, the RST, you know, the, five letters and a vowel thing and then eventually got modified and so you could have because everybody kept on picking rst and l, l and e you know and right. um and uh so that's added um, a good quirk to it but i talked to a statistician friend who was on the show and he said you know I, i've heard people say you need to pick this vowel and these consonants he said it really doesn't matter if they're if if you're on one of those shows where they're trying to save money you know they're going to give you a hard one where you can't you know those yeah. letters won't show up i i saw that so. a few weeks ago it was when the, the the final puzzle was only eight letters two words but yeah <laughs> none, of, none of the letters of the R S T L N E or whatever it is uh, were on there, I think, at all. And then the letters they chose, none of them were on there at all. So they had yeah. absolutely no help. 
<laughs> they had uh, <laughs> during Pat's last week of taping, they had one thing, and th this is composed of an audience of a lot of the alumni members there. And it was just some incredible, you know, something that was like, you know, when it was revealed, there was like, oh, brother, you know, and, and there was audible booing and Pat said, hey, hey, you know, I, <laughs> I didn't do it. I remember when when Pat was out of commission some in 2019 and they had Van on there and the uh, it was place was the category and the answer was quiet boulevard i went what the heck I, and i, I googled <laughs> it and i'm like no it, there was no yeah. google hits of that that's yeah. just a made-up phrase they did because they know it had a q and a v and, and you know it'd be hard for someone to get you know yeah. they they do that at the same time it's been found out they do reuse some puzzles i think they've used niagara falls as an answer like nine times hmm. over the different wow. years just because it it works for them there so. Now, did they always have the clues? You know, nowadays they have like phrase or before and after or whatever. Yeah. Um, did they always have the clues from the beginning? I don't even remember. They, they had the fruit clues from the beginning. <laughs> In the pilot with um, with Ed Burns, they were uh, a little too generous with the cl clues. Like uh, the, the puzzle answer was spaghetti. And he, he would say like, okay, we're looking for something that's really good to eat, you know, and everything. And so when the person <laughs> guessed the tea, you know, and everything like uh, you know, on that one, there'd be some, they, they, by the second guess, I'm ready to solve it. And like, are you sure? You know, and I'm like, yeah, because you gave them the answer pretty much, you know, yeah. so. Um, you, you eat this with meatballs usually yeah, <laughs> and it's Italian. Yeah. <laughs> so, so they made, there been a more variance over the year, you know, originally yeah. it was just like, you know, phrases, people's names, that sort of thing. Now they have the crossword part, you know, where you have to, you know, get, they give you like a word and it's something, the, the answers are connected to that word. Um, they do a lot of that, you know, the before and afters, uh, which is added to a great variety of the show. And um, yeah. I don't think that would have happened because uh, as we said, there, when Merv Griffin owned the show, he was the one coming up with a lot of the puzzles. Huh. So I'm not sure if he'd still been there, if we would have had that um, those tweaks, you know, going on there. There was also, I mentioned in the book, uh, it came up, I think it might have affected Nancy Joan getting getting off the show too. 1994, they introduced this concept called the Mega Word, which was, uh, it's a, a distinctive word you don't usually use that, um, that, you know, it was stuff like extemporize, oxidize oxidize was the worst six minutes trying to solve that thing and then when you solved it they wanted you to use it in a sentence so you <laughs> they get a get a bonus thing and i was like <laughs> yeah I, that was like and pat sajak later said it was the worst thing he think he hated on the show <laughs> there's someone they've got a collection of they did about 32 or 33 of them and watching it you will just be like this is the uh... most this is why this is not what you want to see wheel of fortune be you know esoteric answers right now some of those ones that are kind of more popular like the let's say the prize puzzle or the what's i don't know what it's called but you know they made it make a train sound and you can guess oh yeah the express the, yeah, express yeah, yeah. I, mean, yeah. I mean was who created those were those mervs or is it post -Merv? that was that was after merv that was mary harry friedman and his crew coming up with that and they mm -hmm. came up with the idea yeah like I said, he really wants to um, get a get a lot of puzzles on the board and show it up there and get people, you know, seem it really connected and and um, people like getting there. You know, it's it's kind of a it's a real uh, the the contestants and winners on the show said it's just it's so much different being up there than it is on TV, as you probably expect. But still, yeah. it, some of it considered a, a surreal experience there. You know, and um, and it's you know, you're, you're there, you've got all these elements, you've got the use letter board that people don't see, and you've got to keep that in mind. And you've got to um, figure out, uh, you know, what would be the best to maximize from the uh, amount of money that you spend there. It's all these things going through your head, and it can be a little, little overwhelming there. And um, some of them, some of them literally, it's taken some of them literally years to get on the show. Mm. Uh, because of it, you know, do you think about, because they only take 39 weeks a year. So that's, um, let's see, that's 40 times five, 200. And then you've got three players. So we're talking about a maximum of 600 people on each year, 
you know, mm-hmm. competing. And, you know, there are, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not over a million people wanting to be on the show. So mm-hmm. naturally they, they, they select the ones that have the most personalities as well as what everything they don't want you. If you, <laughs> you know, the, they hate if someone's like, if they're indecisive, or they're too uh, decisive, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, we had one. I went to see the Wheel of Fortune live in Greensboro, about an hour away from here. Mm-hmm. And Bob Gillen, was, who had previously done the daytime show, was there uh, supervising. We had oh, there was one woman who just kept on. She's going, oh, oh, and he said, um, you know, we're gonna if keep you any longer. We're gonna have breakfast here, so, you know, <laughs> to her. And and she eventually won that round, and everybody's like, uh, and then yeah. when Bob went back to go, the announcer said, "That's the first time I, I think we've been on tour where people have actually kind of booed the winner." <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, she didn't win the grand prize, but she that was that's just the type that you you. Luckily, they screen they keep them away from the. Uh, they screen them pretty well on the show to get them there, you know. So, okay. yeah. All right. So let's go through just the hosts and the get uh, the letter terms. Okay. So all the hosts. Um, so we had Chuck Woolery, you said, then Ed Burns, and then Pat Sajak. Vanna filled in temporarily when Pat was out. And, yep. uh, and now Pat, and Pat, I'm sorry. I was going to say, you go ahead. <laughs> and now it's going to be Ryan Seacrest. Is that everyone yeah. who's ever hosted or tried to host the show? No. Okay. Because <laughs> uh, Pat left the daytime version in 1989 to do his CBS late night show. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. So when he did that, then they came up with well, Merv decided to come up with Rolf Benershka, mm-hmm. who was a San Diego Chargers place kicker, who had nearly died and came back and he had had some kind of like. Uh, ostomy problems he went through a lot in his life and he, he was thought he was going to die and he he told his life story there on am los angeles uh the local morning show at the same time when uh, they, they had a, some kind of things where some bunny rabbits were being bunny rabbits and getting horny on the show beforehand <laughs> and that created a lot of comedy and it amused Murr so much that he showed rolf around the studio and everything and then Unbeknownst to Rolf, he got a call on Sunday night saying, congratulations, you're going to be the new host of Wheel of Fortune. We're going to be taping it on Thursday. Oh. And he was like, wow, what? You know, and he had not <laughs> really even seen the show. So he was watching it some there to try and catch up. Uh, but he was, he was personal, but still somewhat stiff and awkward. Uh, the show's ratings were okay in fact at one point he was doing better than Sajak had there for a while but then they went down around the summer and uh nbc decided to cancel the show then because they had gotten rights the rerun the golden girls and at that point as successful as wheel of fortune was it was costing them more to produce the show at nbc than they were getting advertising revenue Mm -hmm. so they decide okay we're gonna we're gonna drop you and uh, CBS picked it up because it had been a strong competitor for them. and But with the proviso that um, Rolf wouldn't be part of the show, which Rolf mm-hmm. realized and everything. And he went on. I tell the host whole story. He's got a really fascinating story before and after the show. Um, in fact, he was there when they were doing the draft. He was the person um, on the San Diego team uh, announcing their draft pick on the NFL a couple of months ago. So he still got a big connection with the area, but Bob Gowen was a replacement. He auditioned with the, some people uh, he had done a few game shows beforehand. He did well. The only problem was CBS being cheap itself too. They limited the budget for the show so much so that for the first time buying a vowel costs $200 rather than two fifty, And there were spaces on the wheel for like $75, huh. you know, and you're like, this is 1989 that's that's ridiculous how much going back they were and they cut back the prizes and it looked cheap and Mm -hmm. eventually um within two years they had uh that was in the early 90s when there was pressure to add more talk shows on tv so with wheel being the least successful on a on cbs's lineup they dropped it there and it went back to nbc because nbc needed anything by then it was really doing bad um, but it only lasted a year there because after that, NBC was losing a lot of um, 
affiliates carrying the show, carrying the show at the same time. Uh, there were like two thirds, only two thirds of affiliates were carrying it uh, by 1991. So they canceled it at the end of the time. And, and that was the beginning of the end for NBC daytime. I kind of summarize it there that they stopped programming the first hour of the, their morning thing and they contracted back. And then now, now it's nothing but today show stuff before, um, <laughs> Right. before nighttime there is no nbc entertainment daytime stuff anymore which is hmm. sad but hmm. yeah. now did anybody else try to host or were they threatening anybody else to host over the years because pat i'm sure was in contract negotiations at various times and there might have been a possibility that he wouldn't return <laughs> when when pat left originally they were um I think Merv was favoring Jimmy Connors, who, who uh, the tennis pro great, who'd done very well, but he was under contract at the time for NBC Sports, and they said no, NBC Sports has to be a priority. And since they tape on the weekends there, you know they couldn't have him do both, so he couldn't do it there. Uh, now Tim Brando, who has been a longtime uh, broadcaster for football and everything like that, ESPN. CBS and everything auditioned and thought he nearly had the job until they decided to go with Rolf instead at the last mm -hmm. minute. Um, and he, he really kind of wishes, you know, he would have been great if he, if they had, had done that, he had gotten permission from ESPN to do it. Cause I think they thought, Hey, we, we can program and this would be great. We'd have, you know, his face on, on, on a network for five days along with us. Um, mm -hmm. So they they had done that there, um, but no. Thereafter, it's been mainly, I think, um, when Pat's uh, talk show failed, I think he realized, okay, my best thing right now is to work on the show because by the 1990s, they basically uh, would tape a season's worth of show in like you know three or four months, mm. you know, and and he could do that, and then he has a home back in Maryland, so he could come in do that, and then go back to his home and do whatever he wanted there for a while and um he and vanna had enough clout they were able to change the uh taping schedule so they would tape in the mornings and afternoons so they have the evenings free when they have the taping as well too so, so how uh, many how many shows do they tape per day then typically they tape typically about like five shows i think yeah so he's only, so typically they just work once a week is that what you're saying yeah for, yeah or four try, they, 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 yeah they yeah they 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 have two two days like that uh, in a week and they tape a couple of them they have a break and okay. do that yeah and so they're able to get a get all stockpiled and everything uh ryan was already taping some this summer you know right. so he's already, they got a good stockpile and i've heard that his first couple of shows probably will be the ones in the middle that they take where he got more used to uh, accustomed to the whole show and its flow and everything. Okay. Like that. So another the, advantage of it. So, yeah. so like the first show he did, is not necessarily what the first exactly. show aired? Okay. Got exactly. It. Yeah. Okay. Now, I'd um, be really surprised if it was, if he is, then he's really hitting it out of the ballpark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, now on this current, did you go into that uh, whole uh, current thing of getting Ryan Seacrest in the book or? Yes, yes. Okay. I've got it so, all the way. I, I've got it all the way through um, the last taping of Pat Sajak show when I I talked to several people who went there to see it, some of the contestants okay. and everything. Yeah, I'd known about it and then about uh, Ryan taking over and getting there. And ironically, uh, Ryan Seacrest, one of his first jobs was a game show for Merv Griffin back in the late 1990s called Click. Yeah, I heard which, that uh, on some interview with him, I think, recently. Yeah, so it was only two seasons um yeah. merv griffin he only had two big hits jeopardy and wheel of fortune he did he made like about 10 other game shows but none of them lasted a year except hmm. for click and that was two years and not really a big success <laughs> but you know it's just proof that if you have one or two hits big enough you can do well in the business mm -hmm. so yeah so uh, on the Ryan thing, since you do discuss it, and so you, yeah, uh, was he a shoe in, or were they considering other people? Because they didn't really talk about much in yeah. the press. I mean, they pretty much said, you know, oh, who's it going to be? Who's it going to be? And they kind of hinted at Vanna. I doubted she was going to yeah. be the host. But then, just out of the blue, they just said it's going to be Ryan Seacrest. To which most people said the did the collective groan at first. He's on everything. Yeah. <laughs> and even he admitted that he was on Sunday yeah. morning this last weekend. And he says, Yeah, I know I have a full plate. I get it. You know, it's yeah. like, you know, but anyway. Well, the reason why, and I talked to several people, and I think it makes sense, is um 
if you remember a couple of years ago when Alex Trebek passed away on Jeopardy, they had a year's worth of rotating guest hosts. Right. And it was just, I some of the personnel on the show told me that it was some of the worst things they ever had. They had, they, these some of them would literally come in and they're like, all right, what have I got to do? What are, you know, and they'd have to tell them and they're like, you know, you've never done this before. And they'd have to ha hand hold them. And it was just driving them above the wall. Oh. Um, and then when they finally decided it was Michael Richards, the executive producer, and then Michael Richards got fired for previous statements that he had. And just, it, I've got a, the whole messy thing in the thing. They did not want a repeat of that. So yeah. I think they made overtures to Ryan to say, he's an established talent. Let's get him. Let's mm -hmm. see what we can do and get him together on board. And if okay. he's able to do it. Yes. I, I, I was one, one of the ones who was like, I wish they had someone else. There's so many other talented ones out there, but yeah. it could have been much worse. We've yeah. seen much worse tried sometimes in these shows. Yeah. So, well, um, in, in his defense, and I'll say this, you know, it's like, I think it was good that they taped some spots with Pat and stuff like that, yeah. kind of, that were humorous and stuff like that. And also, yeah. in his interviews, he knows that, you know, he's kind of omnipresent on the TV schedule. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so. I think he's, I think he's smart and uh, has a good sense of humor about himself. Yeah. And it helps, again, like I said, to have Vanna there. It'll give some continuity. Yeah. Um, and he's not the first that way. I mean, he, one of the people he replaced before, Dick Clark, was kind of omnipresent back in the day. So yeah. it's like, I get yeah. it, you know. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And I think, uh, I think it'll do just fine, you know, with yeah. what they have there. Um, yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's going to still, you know, as long as they keep the game fresh and doing what it is, I think there was some concerns from some of them that sometimes it's not as current as they'd like it to be with some of the expressions and so on that way. <laughs> um, I know Harry Friedman said he's, he's basically shied away and I understand it from uh, pop music titles because there's just not, there's a huge gap in what people know and what people recognize. And there was, and when they tried it, there was one time back, uh, maybe 10 years ago, Lord Helper, there was a woman who was given a song title. It was, um, it was, I, I walked the line by Johnny Cash, but she, she guessed I have the wine by, Johnny. <laughs> that, which would have been a great country song as is, you know, but you know. Yeah, they they've had yeah that that's that's been a little problematic. So they kind of stay away from those areas, and uh, yeah. you know they that that was you know it was I think I found somewhere where it, like they've only done song titles, and they did them pretty much in the early like the from like two around two thousand to twenty fifteen. They did they did them maybe twenty times. I think yeah. it was just not connecting as well with people yeah so although it seemed like they always tended to use standards like they wouldn't use something really obscure or something yeah that just came but, out last week from uh taylor swift or something it's like well you know so it surprised me but they used um soak up the sun by Cheryl crow twice oh wow like she must have some pull there i was like oh well, they had it there. <laughs> yeah i was going over and i went wow okay mm -hmm. Um, Bruce Springsteen, the, yeah, and of course they did the Beatles. I think they did Michael yeah. Jackson some one yeah. time, mm -hmm. yeah. But um, yeah, so okay. uh, yeah. Now going back to um, how many official letter turners have there been besides Susan and Vanna? I mean, I know uh, Pat's daughter did it a couple times when Vanna was hosting, and uh, yeah. then they had like Minnie Mouse and <laughs> characters <laughs> like that. But I mean, was there ever? A third person that was like a, an established person doing the letter turning it, for any period. It's of interesting you said that. They wasn't it was some per, uh, wasn't a permanent one, but Susan Stafford back in 1977. <laughs> you're going to love that. She injured her back doing a stunt for Circus of the Stars. If you remember those specials. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So doing some kind of thing. So she was there at home and she saw they had Summer Bartholomew, who was a former Miss USA, came oh. and took her place and did the thing there. And Susan said, she was watching and she said, you know, you're not, you're not irreplaceable on that show. They can do that show without you. And that was kind of her metamorphosizing into finding something more filling for her in the future there. Um, 
Now, Summer herself, she showed up there several times. She was also a model on the show, someone they'd have gowns for like a bride's week and everything. She was really hoping she could have taken over from Susan, but she is statuesque. And when she stood in heels next to Pat Sajak, Pat is, he's not diminutive, but he is, I don't think he's, I think he's somewhat less than 5'11", maybe. Yeah, I, think I, think he claims five, five, I think he's 5'10", yeah. Yeah, And five, his, ten. Daughter, his daughter even is taller than him, even without yeah, the yeah. So. <laughs> so when she stood next to she was kind of towering over me. And she yeah. said, I knew at that point, I'm like, I'm not going to get the job, you know, from what <laughs> they had there. Yeah. Uh, so that's why they decide to keep with Vanna. And Vanna has just stuck with it ever since as much as possible. Um you know, did, she, did she have any flack because she did that Playboy pictorial, or it wasn't a Playboy pictorial? It was a pictorial that Playboy printed. I don't know if it was. Yeah, they them. printed it. She had <laughs> hung around Hugh Hefner's place, and she posed for those pictures. And they came back to haunt her. What they did, <laughs> and they being Merv Griffin and Nancy Jones, the executive producer of the show, they just it chose to ignore it there, okay. and it kind of passed its way. And there's like, yeah. okay, you know, we've got, you know, they're not they're not going to hold it. And I think that was to their credit. Yeah. Um, they they uh, guy told me they used to have in the audience sometimes some college guys would want them bring their copies of Playboy and want them to want her to sign it and everything's like, no, I'm not. I don't want to, you know. Yeah, because it was when, like I said, she was really struggling when she came there. She had um, grown up in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, which is near the, It's I, I've gone there before because we, we have our uh, family house, our family cottage there, condo, I shouldn't say cottage. <laughs> um, we have a condo there in North Myrtle Beach, and that's uh, near the North Carolina, South Carolina line on the border there. Mm-hmm. Um, she'd done very well modeling there, then went to Atlanta, and then came out to Hollywood in the late seventies or so, but you know, at one time, I think people seen it, the clip where she was on the price is right as a contestant. Oh yeah. She, she, yeah. she didn't win anything, but she got the attraction of the camera, you know? Um, but she really wasn't doing that much. And to be honest, you know, I, I mentioned there about her efforts to be an actress with the goddess of love, in the TV movie back in the, you know, and it, it, she really is not, that great of an actress i think she realized that soon and yeah. like I found, this show is my bread and butter and let me do that yeah. So. yeah and then the the other prominent position i guess would be the announcer so how many announcers have been on the air for over the years okay it started with charlie o'donnell which um i think uh we mentioned before he originally came to claim to fame was uh being with uh, dick clark on american bandstand mm. back in the 19 19- 50s or so and then then when dick and the crew moved out to um uh los angeles uh, in 64 he moved out there too he was the one who did a great job of impressing them he wasn't on the 73 pilot but in the 74 one with ed burns he was the one who denounced the thing a spin it piano da, 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 all here on wheel oh for, and he make it wheel so it made like a circular sound and everything and that yeah. they thought that was great they kept him together. He was with the show until 1980 when they thought it was going to be going off the air. So when he heard that, he got some other announcing jobs and couldn't do it when they got the, the turnaround of like, oh, yeah, it's going to be on the air. He's like, well, I've already signed to do Bullseye and some other wonderful projects there. <laughs> um, so then Jack Clark replaced him. Jack Clark <clears throat> probably is best known beforehand if if you were watching TV in the 70s as host of the Crosswits oh, game yeah. But he was hurt by the fact that he um, had prematurely gray hair he, in his 40s, maybe even in his 30s or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that kind of limited his um, ability. So we went back to he'd been announcing on TV since the 1950s and done everything, Tattletales, a lot of other ones. So they replaced um, Charlie with Jack Clark. Jack stayed with the show until 1988 when, unfortunately, he died of bone cancer at mm-hmm. age 62. So then they had a couple of substitute hosts like M.G. Kelly, who I got to talk to, who's a radio personality there in uh, Los Angeles and really enjoyed doing the show. Uh, And then (laughs) they were kind of holding out. And then in 1989, finally, (laughs) Charlie, Charlie was able to go from his last job that was holding him back, which was a remake of The Gong Show. 
of all things. <laughs> and he was able to rejoin them. They had a good time. And then he died. He was with the show until he died unexpectedly in sleep uh, at, um, in 2010, 20, 2010 or 2011. And then Jim Thornton took over. Okay. And, yeah. Okay. Since that. Um, so yeah, they, uh, they've had pretty good stability with their announcers. I'd say. Everything okay. There. It's almost like Jeopardy. Jeopardy has said, you know, only a couple, I think, <laughs> you know, maybe. Yeah. Johnny yeah. Gilbert, Johnny Gilbert, Johnny Gilbert's still doing it in his yeah. mind. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Incredible. on the original, was it always Don Pardo or? Don Pardo was always the original. Okay. Yeah. That's what that was when they were doing it in New York. Yeah, okay. The original. Yeah. Okay. That, so, yeah. Um, now, when you're doing all this stuff, I guess you overlap quite a bit with Jeopardy and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Um, is there plans to do a Jeopardy book at some point or no? <laughs> I think that would be wear me out. That would be an even more elaborate story to tell than Wheel of Fortune because, you know, it started earlier and had all these other things. I do reference about um, the remake they tried back in the late 70s on NBC and why that didn't work. And it shows up here and there, but um no jeopardy would just be that one would really wheel of fortune like i said it's 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 pretty you know i my book is over a hundred thousand words and everything which sounds like a lot but it's pretty compact it's about a little over 300 pages and i think it moves pretty quickly and i wanted to have one you know we're talking about a game show and let's keep it let's keep it light and friend right. and fresh and everything and i try and do that with the the history of the show while pointing out a lot of things people may not know of uh, yeah. or might have forgotten about it at the same time so and uh i i think it i hope it succeeds i guess i've i've heard from several of the cadets who really enjoy what it had there and um susan stafford's uh representative said she's liked the book too so that was good to know. Do you have a lot of images in the book or just a few? Yes, okay. I do. I do. Okay. I got from uh, Adam Needif and also from a few of the people who appeared on the show. They gave some that they had there. Um, a lot of uh, ones, including going all the way back to surprise me that there were some still images from the original 1973 pilot. Mm -hmm. Chuck Woolery yeah. there and got it together and um, a lot of different perspectives on uh, the set and how it looked over the years and uh, um, a few uh, offstage shots of some people as well. What did Adam think of this? Did he goes, I was going to do a Wheel of Fortune book. <laughs> no, Adam Needif was very supportive. He was, okay. he gave me a lot of the, <laughs> the pictures and everything. I think he was very happy. In fact, uh, he was doing an article on Wheel of Fortune and asked me to uh, copy edit for him. So I was like, okay, thank you. Very cool. um, okay. So, you know, <laughs> um, there was no, animosity that i got from a very very supportive you know i've tried to support him any way i can yeah. with everything on different things and um yeah. you know, so and he does more he does more profiling of you know biographies of people involved you know or i do more of the not videographies but you know kind of the, the histories of the shows themselves right Know, and wonder. to give Adam a little plug, you know, because he's been on here before, you know, he's written yeah. books about the match game and the gong show yeah. and uh, yeah. password, I believe, you know, yeah. and a couple others. But, but he anyway. talks about, he talks about, he also does a good thing of getting into people's personal details. I do some of that here, but I don't yeah. go into like, I know at the end, Chuck Woolery had five wives. I don't go into what happened. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah. he just admitted, you know, he yeah. had five wives on in the interview and that sort of thing. I don't, I don't, um, I mention personal things only if they, you know, affect the show some way. Like when Vanna White's boyfriend uh, died in a plane crash in 1986 and Susan Stafford had to come in and substitute for her. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, okay. Yeah. And she substituted for a week and she's like, they were giving me old clothes as if to kind of say to you, to me, you know, you're, you're here as only a substitute. You're not going to get this job back. And she's like, <laughs> I didn't want that, but I was just doing it because I know it was a tough time for right. She was in mourning and everything. So, yeah. Speaking, so speaking, I that. speaking of wanting it back, did uh, Chuck Woolery ever want it back or did he, find greater fame like with love connection and stuff like that <laughs> he, he had scrabble which has a lot of scrabble, elements yeah, of, yeah, of yeah. you know kind of like a wheel of fortune type thing um i think he was okay with all the stuff um but i think he regretted being a little the way he handled uh wheel of fortune i think he would have would have liked to stay with it hmm. you know um uh but um at the same time he went ahead and you know he had a 
pretty good career for what he had at the time there. And he did uh, remember it affectionately. The thing that kills me, um, uh, he was hosting a game. I, I always forget what the title it is, but uh, in the late nineties, it was on Fox. He was hosting it. And it, one, one category was for TV experts, supposedly. And they had a question, what, show did chuck woolery not host and one of the answers was wheel of fortune and the the contestant said oh there's no way he ever hosted wheel of fortune that's got to be the answer and then chuck was like <laughs> that was my first show you know <laughs> he was he was just looking at the camera like that's i can't funny. believe this you know but that's the way you know that that's the way it goes sometimes you know and people even you can do a show for seven years and people will forget about it because uh, yeah. it's just just the way the medium is mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah, the the question I have, I, I don't know if yeah. you have, have any knowledge of this or if anybody, um, it always seems like on some episodes, like, you know, we get the wheel back here. There's only two bankrupts yeah. listed, uh, pictured on here. But do they sometimes add more bankruptcies if, like, they think, oh, you know, we, we're on a tight budget this week because we gave away a million dollars a couple of times, so we'll slap a couple <laughs> more bankrupts on the wheel. <laughs> no, they don't do that. Like I said, okay. it, would be, it would be the the bonus round where you get, you know, some stupid, I think one they hate, they hated recently was wide empty field or something like, you know, some kind of thing that no one, a phrase no one really says, you yeah. know, that they, yeah. it's where they're, they're trying to make it up and they just know, there's uh, <clears throat> no chance of winning that. That helps them keep down the budget that way. But they've <laughs> always, they've always, yeah. As far as I know, you know, the first round is just one bankrupt, and the second round they'd added a second bankrupt okay. on to get it together. And um, you know, they do have. Uh, well, some... they have that one that's either ten thousands or fifty fifty. If yeah, that, that fifty fifty. Yeah. I was going to yeah. prove that one. Yeah. Yeah. So Does that, that count that... as one of the two or uh, just? Uh... Is it a no, that's one? a different, that's a third one. Yeah. Okay. I okay. have a lot of different elements on those. So, yeah. Okay. But they don't, you know, because there's some shows you watch and it seems like every contestants get bankrupt three times in a row. And then they finally are starting to win a little money and they go, well, that's it. That's the end of the game. And then they have to give them consolation of thousand. You yeah. know? It's like, thanks for playing. You know? I think um, um, this is going way back, but there was a show back in the early seventies called the money game that the movie game. Yeah. with army archer hosting and then some celebrity i want to say buddy hack it could have been someone else figured out that the way they were doing it there was no way a person could win the game win the the ultimate big prize on the show because of the way it was set up you know it came to that night and i think that probably have led to its cancellation at the time there but uh <laughs> but no they have they still it's syndicated but they still go through a lot of standards and practices and if they see anything weird and several contestants said they've been there were some shows they were taping where Pat would think he'd he heard the audience from someone out and the, uh, the answer from someone in the audience would say, okay, we're not, we're, we're going to throw that one out. We're going to have another puzzle instead. Anytime that anything was not done there. And, and um, sometimes that was a turning point on some of the shows there. Uh, some yeah. people said, you know, the second one was able to get it there, you know? So. Well, that 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 happens sometimes. I think uh, you know at the end, you know, it's like it's obvious that what the puzzle is. And Pat traditionally will say, "Audience, please, no help from the audience." Blah 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 blah. But yeah. some people can't help themselves. So what happens in a situation like that? Do they just have to toss out the puzzle and start all? They over do. Again? They toss out the puzzle, uh, and then yeah, sucks. and then <laughs> yeah, and, and then it's amazing, you know. But and it's also. You wonder what it's like in the audience because I remember there was one. I've got several in the book that you're just like, how did they miss that? <laughs> there was one where um, <clears throat> it was a thing, I guess it was, and it was the first was obvious, obviously magic, and the last four letters you they were missing the first letter, but the last three were A and D. Yeah. So instead of guessing magic wand, the guy goes magic band. Yeah. Magic hand, magic, uh, it was magic. And you're just like, what, what, what? you know, <laughs> how, how can you not, you know, um, there was also a woman had almost everything, but uh, couldn't guess the last couple letters for the thrill of victory, the agony to see. And she had gotten like 5,000 or $6,000 amassed and, and <laughs> all lost. Everybody's like, Oh gosh. No. You know, I think there, I think there's one that I've seen, you know, on, on YouTube is like the the entire puzzle was revealed just because of the nature of how it worked. 
and all they had to do is read it and the person misread it <laughs> they had a hard time there they uh live with uh regis and kelly ripa with uh, Regis Philbin and Kelly Ripa, and they couldn't pronounce her last name. Ripa, R Ripa, Ripa, yeah. you know, and they would go through, and you're just like, uh, because they were, you have to pronounce it correctly as part of the yeah. the rules. Well, um, there was uh, Saint Thomas Aquinas. I hope I, Aquinas. I don't even know. I don't have <laughs> correctly there yeah. that they had on the daytime show. And Rolf Bernuschke said they went through about nine times. They had to edit it down to make sure wow. people were having a hard time pronouncing it. Yeah. Well, the one I saw, it, it, I can't even remember the phrase, but it was, it wasn't that it was hard to pronounce. It's just they substituted like the with a or something like that. Yeah. Said yes. the on the screen, but they read it as a or yeah or they're, they're sticklers about that it yeah, really is yeah. it's yeah. insulting that but that's <laughs> that's part of the requirements they they have there on the on the show and it um you know it, it's part of the appeal the show is appeal too because sometimes the slip-ups are rather freudian like the one they had uh recently when it was during the last week of pats when the guy thought it, instead of this is the best he thought it was right in the butt right <laughs> and and, he, and they they the people um i talked to for the book said that they were laughing they were laughing so hard there they were like they had to edit it down because like two or three minutes of laughter from the right, right and um yeah they 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 do have that and and, and one of the contestant coordinators said it, it's it, it's even during the practice puzzles he remembers yeah. some of the the one he remembers best is um it was uh, a phrase and it was the answer was lord and master but it, and it was during couples week uh, the guy blurted out hard and faster you know <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the one i remember i think it was in hawaii or at least at a hawaiian set i don't know if it's actually yeah. filmed in hawaii but uh they insisted the contestants that the last word was horse and he, you know i don't think he really stormed off the stage but he kind of yeah. had just stormed off the stage yeah. You know, <laughs> Mock protest. yeah yeah because they kept saying that the last word was horse and it wasn't it yeah. was, the last word was like worst or something yeah it was revealed <laughs> yeah well i think it probably was in hawaii because they were going on location there for a while yeah. they did yeah. they were on location from uh, do i think it was 87 or 88 they started at new york city's radio city music hall for the first one and then the last one was at epcot mm -hmm. in 2017 to celebrate uh its 35th anniversary uh they stopped going on location because it was just too expensive oh, they'd okay. have to have some help from the stations that aired it to get with the things but by the end it was costing like three four million dollars yeah. Uh, to tape in there and it's just not uh, effective okay. so now it's pretty much assured we're, we're only going to see it in the studio there at culver city okay did you uh, ever see a show either in in hollywood or elsewhere or whatever i did not okay. i have not I've not done that now i've been to for a time when it was on cbs it was um done there at um television city in hollywood which unfortunately is no longer television right. city in hollywood there uh for a time they did and before that they had done it at the nbc burbank studios which is also no longer there you right. know so and then when sony took it over that's when they moved it to their culver city uh studios mm -hmm. and they have that uh put together at the time but yeah mm -hmm. i'd been to i'd been to both burbank and uh cbs television city but not to the sony one okay so and you've the, seen the you've seen the set you just haven't yeah watched an actual yeah game. okay yeah cool. yeah and i haven't seen that in, but yeah but the and the you know the um audience seating is not that big really. right yeah so, they show it sometimes on the screen so yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. um I, re I remember when they still were doing traveling and i was still living in california uh, I really tried hard, but didn't make it uh, to be in the audience for the Palace of Fine Arts episodes that uh -huh. were in San Francisco. But, you know, yeah. everybody wanted to be on that show. But I had yeah. a few leads, you know, because I know people in the industry, but it just didn't pan out. Everybody wanted to be in the audience on those shows. You know, yeah. it, was, it was a week's worth, five, day, five days, but still. You know? <laughs> yeah 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 it's 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 competitive and it's odd because during the early years you know they were having trouble getting audiences for the show <laughs> i mm -hmm. talked with shelly herman who was a page there at nbc in the 70s she said oh, no yeah. the hot tickets were the gong show 
yeah. and um, the Hollywood Squares mm -hmm. um, on game shows, and then um, the Tonight Show, of course, as well. You yeah. know, for um, Wheel of Fortune, they had, you know, kind of like the retirees and everything. They got in there a lot, you know, yeah. to, you know, to see the shows and get them together. And she said there was a certain, uh, some contingent, like uh, some women thought that Chuck Woolery was handsome and sexy. And so there was some of that, but, you know, it wasn't unusual for them to have a half field audience. Right. Shows. Well, I mean, we already talked about it, but I mean, it, you know, the show started off kind of nerdy, as it were, for the lack of a better term, you know, with all the yep. shopping and everything, you yeah. know, and, and, you know, most of the improvements, I think, were for the better, you know, that, you know, you had the bonus round, you could possibly win a million dollars. Yeah. Uh, they wild, made a, wild cards and things like that so you know the to the show's credit even during the years with merv they always were listening to the audience about what they said and which ways they can improve it that's why they cut down on the number of appearances people had and tried to uh you know uh, get things make a couple of changes and tweaks uh together that made it more appealing for everyone else uh you'd think that um, more shows would do that, but not all do sometimes, right. <laughs> or sometimes they do and it's too late, you know. Yep. All right. Well, I think that's all the questions I have. Is there anything, <laughs> any like deep, dark secret or any really funny thing that you wanted to say that might be in the book and they read the <laughs> book to find out more or something? <laughs> any deep, dark secrets? Uh, let's see. Um, I think it was interesting there to, um, it was definitely interesting talking to a lot of the network pro, uh, pro programmers and how they went there. The, it, one of them, two of them, in fact, worked under Fred Silverman in the late seventies and one of them loved him and one of them hated them. <laughs> and uh, the one that hated him had to work with him on, on the, on the thing there uh, going at the time. Um, and it brought out too, when I was talking to all of them, there were really not, people weren't clamoring for the job of being um, daytime vice president of programming <laughs> at these places. They, they basically thought, okay, it's game shows and soaps and I'm not interested in. It. So there was not that much competition really to get those shows. Um, the basically the people who were there loved it and wanted to do it there. And um, that was kind of, um, you know, a, a good factor. You know, we have, I try and give credit for Lynn Boland for, putting the show together and getting it that, the way she did. It's a, it's a biggest tribute to her practices as a programmer there. Uh, but when she left uh, NBC in late 75 to go into her own production, uh, her successors just were not as hmm. you know good. And the show and the network went from first to third and never got out of it there. <laughs> Um, and it, it's, it's a good thing that luckily they had Merv had a good, a small crew, but they were very committed to that show. And that's what kept it going over the years. And, um, you know, you have, uh, when you have people like that who are committed, it's very, very good to have to, to get, generate success. And one other thing too, uh, we just had the Emmy awards. You realize that it's been on the year 50 years. Yet, Wheel of Fortune has won the Outstanding Game Show Emmy one time. Hmm. And the one time it won, it tied with Jeopardy. That's, that's just amazing to me. I what, like year that. Was, what year was that? 2011. 2011. Oh, wow. Okay. And so, and so um, Harry Friedman was producing both shows, so he got two Emmys. That <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah there's a lot and i uh there's a lot of good stories from the contestants themselves about how they went to get on the show and got together and uh i think you're gonna enjoy it and you know i tried to i tried to be charitable because some of them i was like why did you do that i, I know you're gonna hate me but i gotta ask why did you decide <laughs> not you know why did you guess that or why didn't right. you, you know and uh, they, they explain it there. So I think it, I think it gives you a really good sense and appreciation of the show. That's what I hope. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Well, here's plug time, as we always do. So, you know, uh, what's the name of the book again? Uh, how can you get a copy of it and how they okay. can reach you if they have any questions or want to? Yeah. Uh, the uh, book is called I'd Like to Buy a Vowel, Spinning 50 Years of Wheel of Fortune. It's available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Goodreads, and I think you can get copies there on the BearManorMedia.com uh, 
website as well. They've got some stuff for sure there. And uh, it's uh, available in hardback and soft cover. Uh, I think we're going to have a Kindle, but if we are, I don't know. Just keep an eye out there. It's not anything to, but it is available, you know, and available for shipping. And it, I think it can make a good uh, Christmas gift for anybody who wanted it or any kind of holiday or birthday gift you want to get there at the same time. Like I said, 300 pages, very easy to read indexed and all sorts of stuff and includes a appendix at the end where which updates you on whatever happened to people connected the show over the years and that was kind of fun to write too very cool yep all right uh last question any future books in the planning at the moment or no <laughs> i have told everyone that if I do one, it'll be my 12th and last one. It'll be an even dozen for me. I don't want to jinx it with a 13th. And it's, um, as you know, it can really, it takes a lot out of you when oh, you're yeah. researching these things, uh, you know, setting up the interviews, doing the interviews, and then compiling them in a way that makes sense and so on there. Um, and, um, and like I said, I've covered most of the areas that I'm interested in because I'm mainly as classic TV, you know, and so right. I've written about Betty White, Bob Hope, Carol Burnett show and you know, Wheel of Fortune now. Um, so it's it's very small things that I haven't been touched on yet, you know, and we need to be compelling stories. So I'm gonna see, but right now I'm just having fun promoting the book and uh sure. you know, enjoying the fruits of my labor, so to speak. Very cool. Well, I'll certainly get a copy. I I uh, <laughs> you know, always I, I have most of your books. I can't say I have all of them, but I, I have all the more <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. yeah, I know. I'm same here on yours. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, more's coming for me. I, 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 I hit the dreaded 13 at one point, but I kind of fudged around. I said, well, maybe this one, does, you know, because I, I, I'm not really. Well, you did those two barters. You did yeah. the two barters. So yeah, I, I, I'm two. not really superstitious, but then I said, ooh, 13th book, and then now, now I'm like at 21 or 22. Yeah, and I'm like, well, that was a long time ago. Now I don't know what was the. 13th yeah. Book. <laughs> anyway, i'll see how it so, goes you know i'll yeah. see what i because i'm getting closer to retirement lord help me but <laughs> um you know like i said it has to be one has to be a subject that i enjoy writing you know and yeah. i have enjoyed the last ones where i i thought after betty white there's nothing more fun than writing about betty white and this yeah. hit me and this has been really good to to tap into a lot of the people who had a yeah. stake in the show so yeah well i like you i'm like I, I've re written about everything I want to write, yeah, but then, yeah. you know, it's like, and then something else comes along because, you know, the, the next one is a crazy magazine book because I did mad yeah. and I did cracked <laughs> and I go, and that one was a breeze to do. I'm doing yeah. the final edits on that one right now, but. Are you going to do sick? Are you going to do well, sick? Well, <laughs> the problem with sick, and I'll, I've said it before on here, is that uh, the Simon estate, the Joe Simon estate thinks that it's worth more than it is. Oh, and I brother. go, it's not. So it's yeah. like they would put the kibosh on it, which is unfortunate. I'm trying to work with them. We'll see. I, I you know, I'm not put, getting my hopes up. You know. Yeah. Good luck <laughs> yeah. if you can do it there. You yeah, know. I, I, I hate you, it I when families get involved and they say, "Oh, this uh, 70 year old material is really valuable," and it's like, "No, it's not." It, it, it happens <laughs> a lot of areas. I think there was. Um, I heard Rhino Records was wanted to do a said on the dave clark five but dave clark was asking for an astronomical fees yeah. involved you know it's 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 sad but that's what happens sometimes yeah. you know, with the people so, involved no sick book but you know there's a few other books i have up my sleeve still but you know yeah. it's like it, it, i'm like you i it's like I, i've gotten to the point where it's like i, I have most of the concept of uh, the books out that i wanted to do so i don't know you know yeah yeah so, that's good that's good to have it. it's gravy at this point so that's yeah. good to know yeah because <laughs> there were ones that i really wanted to do like the harvey comics companion things like that yeah so, and yeah. those are all done so i go hey you know now i can just yeah have fun yeah with it, so. yeah <laughs> I, yeah i've always said like i thought i said everything i wanted to say about some of these things but you know sometimes stuff comes up different perspective yeah. Yeah. so i'll say i'll just say yes i'm planning on a 12th and that'll be <laughs> it but but yeah. don't hold me to it. You know, I'm yeah. not swearing on anything. So. Yeah. Well, at least you had fun doing the Wheel of Fortune book, it sounds like. Yeah, so. yeah, I think I think so. And I think people will have a good time reading it. I hope so. All right. Well, thank you, Wesley. And even if you don't write any more books, you know, you're <laughs> always welcome back. We can uh, discuss other TV shows. We've done that before. But right. anyway, for now, 
I will let you go and uh, get this man's book on the Wheel of Fortune and watch the new Wheel of Fortune with Ryan Seacrest. I'm going to in about a half hour. So <laughs> anyway, all right. Uh, and that wraps it up for another Fun Ideas podcast. I'm your host, Mark Arnold, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>